Hello and welcome to Power Reflections, a proud member of the Doof Network, where we reflect on Wildbo's most runaway work as it releases. I'm Ruben Morehouse, podcaster of many titles, the first of which being that I'm the host of Power Reflections, except for the most recent reflecting episode in which we gave the reins to Malia and Jenny, and for the holiday episodes in which I was away on holiday. Sorry, Ruben, are you Ruben, are you seriously doing this? Elliot, sir, uh, please can you stop interrupting me during the intro? We just need one good take, so now I need to start again. You, no, um, you really don't. So, Elliot, sir, please don't interrupt me while I'm doing my intro. I'll start again. God damn it. Hello and welcome to Power Reflections, a proud member of the Doof Network, where we reflect on Wildbo's most runaway work as it releases. I'm Ruben Morehouse, podcaster of many titles, the first of which being that I am the host of Power Reflections, except for the most recent reflecting episode in which we gave the reins to Malia and Jenny, and for the holiday episodes where I was away and Elliot did them by himself. My second podcasting title is that I was the host of Media MD a show where each fortnight we took it in turns to recommend each other media we had somehow missed, although the format of the show changed over the years, so that description was not entirely accurate, but nonetheless, I retained Tenya as the host of this podcast for its entire duration. Third amongst my podcast titles is Deep Impact, the progenitor of Power Reflections, the show in which you are currently listening to, where we listened, uh, looked at Wabo's most well-podcasted work five years on, culminating at a 24-hour live stream, which we may some day hope to outdo when Bell reaches its conclusion. Fourth in my list of podcasting titles is as the Game Master of Pace, a real play show set in a theoretical future of the otherverse, the universe of stories explored in the aforementioned Deep Impact and Peril Reflection shows. Fifth among my podcasting titles, and indeed the most brief, is as host of the pilot season so, which took place between Deep Impact and Peril Reflections, and was where we experimented with other stories or ideas to follow for a new show that we may someday return to. My sixth podcasting title, and another hosting position I may one day return to, was as the host or co-host of Doof Media's Game Club, a spin-off of the more longevious Doof Media Book Club, where each month we played a game with the community and then met to discuss its design, until placing the club on hiatus due to other commitments, including my dedication to my first title as host of the aforementioned Power Reflection, excluding the most recent reflecting episode in which we gave the reins to Malia and Jenny, and for the holiday episodes where I was away and Elliot did them all by himself. Now, my final podcasting title is the most discombobulated and yet most important of all of them. For I, Ruben Morehouse, have also served as a guest host on a number of other podcasts beyond the ones I have listed here as podcasts I have hosted, those being Power Reflections, Media MD, Deep Impact, Pilot Season, and Game Club. I've appeared as a guest on Doofcast, the Doof Network's titular weekly podcast discussing all kinds of media, and on Do the Right Thing, where I presented a story that I wrote in a mere 30 minutes. And joining me today is my co-host. <sighs> I'm Elliot Diebold. And we're coming at you live in the Discord. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Yes, uh, welcome. Um, you know, kind of bouncing off of that um, brief introduction, uh, mm. it is worth noting that this week, Pale hit 3 million words. So, hey. uh, you know, as Ruben has just finished reading out 3 million words, <laughs> <laughs> the story has also hit that. Oh, yeah, God, reading that long of a set of intros, <laughs> my mouth is like jelly now. <laughs> anyway, yeah, um, hi, everybody. Welcome to the show. Uh, just a quick housekeeping note. Uh, we're only covering In Absentia 21.4 this chapter because otherwise that we just wouldn't have enough time to cover them both with all that intro. Mm, yeah, that's yeah, that was that was the reason. Mm -hmm. um, also, uh, the costume contest, it's still ongoing. Uh, Halloween's coming up is that is halloween the last day of the month so it's like a week and yeah, a bit away yeah. how do you not know the day of halloween oh, I, yeah, I forget um yeah okay cool so well, yeah if you it know, helps get costumes. halloween is also my friend's birthday so uh, ah. if that's helpful yeah that makes it easier yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, cool. So yeah, get those costumes ready. Um, <laughs> any any Walbo story? Uh, mm -hmm. I, I I heard Malia and Jenny point out that we didn't list Pate as a valid story mm. in yes. in the list in the doc, and that is absolutely an error on our end. A Pate mm -hmm. costume is more than welcome. <laughs> yes, uh, of course. Any any costume from any Walbo story, um, including face, uh, yeah, you're welcome to to do. <laughs> um. Anywho, should we get onto the onto the show? We're talking about In Absentia 21.4 uh, this week, covering uh, L Lucy chapter. Um, Lucy starts, as a lot of Lucy chapters start, with her trying to get ready for the day ahead, but really struggling without the uh, creature comforts of home and the people of home. <laughs> yeah, I, I, 
I really enjoy how much Pale is, is making us feel this time as fugitives and like how it's getting to the Kenneteers. Like mm, yeah. something I've I've always really appreciated about Wabo's writing is the way he's able to create like stakes that are not just like death. Like, you know, characters will get injured and that or, or that actually impacts things. Like it doesn't have to be death to, as a stake to matter, which is a lot of uh, which is a hurdle that a lot of other stories fall on. And I, I yeah. feel like we're seeing that in, in full bore on in, in this arc. Like for all the characters in this arc, there's been a real edge to their perspective and you can just feel the, the, the tension and like, it, I don't know, it's really working to sort of escalate how this arc feels that like, you know, we start with Lucy here and it's really getting to her that she can't bulletproof her look. She can't take care of her hair. Like she likes Sue. she's missing her mom and Booker. Like it's each chapter is starting on these notes. So each kind of tear of just like, this is rough. Yeah, we we obviously know how important this bulletproofing thing is to Lucy because it's yeah. been brought up so many times, and it's such a great way of like s- setting up or continuing this theme of just how disconnected and I guess exiled vibe the Kenneteers have. Um, yeah. It's really just a nice start to the chapter, and obviously, kind of it weighs on Lucy's mind pretty heavily throughout the rest of the chapter as well. Yeah. And and I guess, like, you know, we've obviously, I think, already kind of talked to death about how this is, like, perfect for a story that's been all about building community and, and building a sense of home that they've had that ripped away from them for the finale. Yeah, asterisk. Finale. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but, like, I, I guess beyond just what a great idea it is in story to, like, challenge the Kenneteers and stuff, this week I felt like I was really appreciating how much it's escalating the stakes for me as a reader. Like, I... It's stressing me out how off kilter and alienated the Kenneteers are feeling. Like I, I felt the same way in the Avery chapter last week, but I think it really hit me in this one that it's like this isn't just a cool story idea. This is really working yep. on me to escalate the stakes in my head. Yeah, uh, definitely, and and kind of setting up the Kenneteers as more I don't know, like likely to make mistakes or just more. Yep at the end of their rope i suppose um you really would, feel it, lucy it really feels like they're all being given chances to backslide a lot as well yes, in yes, some of their growth sure. i think we talked about that a bit last week but like 21.1 i think was the other lucy chapter in this arc but it was so it, it dedicated a lot more time to just like setting up the premise for the arc whereas this is a much more lucy driven lucy chapter mm. uh, and this is one where we're really seeing how much she yeah, is being presented with this opportunity to like like she's she's clamping up a bit because she's worried about seeming weak um you know obviously last chapter was all about do we want to kill innocence and the answer was kind of yes um <laughs> and you know like obviously fighting too much is, is something we'll see has struggled with in the past so like there's a chance that something like that could come up again i i guess we'll see but yeah yeah definitely um so yeah, uh, the Kennetiers catch up a bit collectively as they look over their plans for the day ahead, traveling, lawyering, working with the Ottawa Council, and then of course, if all goes well, uh, summoning the Alabaster, I guess, or, or yeah. sticking it to the Alabaster. Yeah, yep. um, I do love this moment where like Verona is sort of really cu- like leaning in on Lucy and like sort of cuddling her and. Mm. Uh, Lucy is like, oh, you're clingier these days. Are you missing your cat? <laughs> Verona's just like, yeah, yeah, I'm doing this for my sake. Like, sure. Um, <laughs> it's and, some like, great emotional awareness by Verona to be uh, support- yeah. so supportive of Lucy when she's having a rough time. And real um, Arc 13 Verona level self-reflection from Lucy that she doesn't realise how much she's just emanating vibes of needing support, um, which, I, I again, I think came up last week too. But, um, I, I yeah, I guess, you know... It's, Something that is, you know, easy to keep in mind as the Kenneteers are starting to fade back into each other's banners is how much this is really an arc where we're seeing them come together. And, like, this this bit with Verona is obviously, like, touching on that. There's been so many moments in these last few weeks where we're really seeing how the Kenneteers are just there for each other in ways I don't think the others even realise how much they needed. Like, they're really anticipating each other's needs and, and just, like, yeah, helping each other so naturally and intuitively um mm. it's you know it's nice yeah this is what the story kind of used to be like back in arc 10 <laughs> so it's, it's nice to have it yeah. back it, it is good i mean you know it's a real monkey's paw wish that we've wished for the kennedys to be back together again and the answer is okay well we'll do that by having yeah. them be exiled um but no uh i do love 
uh, how bad Lucy is at being supported compared to how good she is at supporting her team. But, um, or like, you know, accepting support, I guess, but she's mm. what she's bad at. But it, it was really nice to reread this chapter and just be like, Lucy is so worried that everything is going to go wrong at every step of this plan. Yeah. But actually this plan, it, this chapter, everything kind of goes perfectly. And it's just really nice to be like, no, Lucy, <laughs> you're just being kind of negative because this plan is awesome and it works out really well. Yeah. Well, almost too well, I think. No. <laughs> um <laughs> Uh-oh. Yeah, uh, no, I I agree. Like, I I think it's all quite justifiable fears by Lucy, but it, you're right. She she has that moment where you can see it would lead her into a spiral. Except Verona and Avery are kind of there, and they're just like, look, if if little bits don't work, we'll figure it out. It's going to be fine. Um, and I, like Lucy is just someone who needs to hear shit like that every now and then, and um, she just wasn't really aware of it right now. But yeah, mm. yeah. So the Kenneteers are heading to Ottawa, but to get there, they need to take a nice stroll through a new path. Yeah, and not to just, like, immediately gainsay myself, but, like, after talking over how much better the Kenneteers are doing it, understanding each other and working together, um, obviously they're not at 100% because... Lucy is fucking miserable on these paths and it's just kind of hilarious how little Avery seems to really understand that like when Lucy stressed her bullshit fuse is even shorter than normal and so like a path is just hilariously a bad place for her to be and it Mm -hmm. it was great for us as readers this chapter because Lucy's just having a miserable time on this path and that was fun as hell to read but like <laughs> I-, I love how even Li- like there's that bit where liberty's leaving and she's like please don't go too hard on avery like <laughs> yeah so, there, there probably needs to be a very frank conversation about what paths they're taking at this point because lucy is going to be in trouble if they keep doing it like this yeah this path i was kind of surprised i mean i i guess we know that the fan stuff is doesn't match lucy's style um but yeah it just seems like She's so not in the zone for even yeah. bothering with this path. Like, I, I love that. Sorry, can I just read out the transition to this path? Because yeah, it's yeah. so funny in the story. It's like, uh, Verona is like, you like travel, right? And Avery and Snowdrop both say, like, yes. Mm. Um, and then it's like, it's a good way to recharge the batteries, right? And Lucy doesn't answer. And instead, we just get the section break. And then it's just... As she stepped through the doorway, Lucy was confronted by about a thousand dolls with exaggerated and high fashion stylings. <laughs> it was like the opposite of fucking recharging her batteries. It's such a good transition. You're just like, oh, this is going to be a nightmare for Lucy. Yeah. <laughs> um, I love Liberty's vibe in this path as well. It's so funny. It's like, because at the end of the path, it seems like she's made this conscious choice to be as kind of goofy and... Yeah. annoying as possible to keep them in like fun mode rather than like thinking about how they're never going to see their family again maybe mode yeah um, which is still... always a high risk that's always a high risk strat for people because i think we talked about this recently i think someone like verona really likes that but like you know lucy might stab you if you're trying to joke around if, if, if she thinks yeah. things are serious yeah and that's i mean we're in lucy's head so that's kind of how i felt towards the beginning of this chapter and it was just like man liberty dial it down a bit and then when <laughs> liberty finally confides in lucy at the end of like hey this was intentional and lucy's just kind of like oh that makes so much sense it was very <laughs> funny yeah um yeah i, I like zachary's calling out in the chat and i had the same thought i, I loved it there's almost a sense that like this path gets easier for lucy when the finder shows up later because it's like oh cool there's something to fight like it's like it's it's almost easier for her to deal with this bullshit when there's like a target to throw spears at or whatever mm. um but yeah uh I, I like going back to liberty i i fully agree i it, there's also funny like it, it's the classic thing with goblins like liberty is both a blessing and a curse on this path like her goblins kind of come in clutch to beat the finder but also they they kind of almost don't make it out because they're waiting for some of the goblins mm. um and then, yeah, she's like, right, pain. She keeps slowing them down because she's trying to take this photo. But also her holding the camera in her hand when she changes clothes lets them know that you can keep some of your items by holding them in your hands, so which is like mm. new information Avery wants to take back to the guy. Yes, yes. So like, yeah, like Liberty just embodies that chaotic goblin vibe in this section where it's like, I can't decide whether bringing her was a net positive or a net negative because it's so much of both. 
Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. It's, and it's very fun for us as a reader, but, you know, yeah. we're in Lucy's head this chapter, so yeah. you really <laughs> feel the frustration. <laughs> So I, I also I, I forgot to call out the the second line in this section. As soon as they get onto the paths, I think it just continues to sell how not here for it Lucy is because she she lands on this path and the first thing she thinks is as she's been told by as she had been told by Avery she kept still and then the very next line is Avery saying come on don't stand around we have to move fast on this one mm. <laughs> you can just. You can feel the very, very short fuse in Lucy just halving in length with with the very opening move in this in this path. I fucking loved it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it is good. Um, <laughs> yeah, you're right. The very the very start being that Lucy did the one thing she's been told to do, and then it being the wrong thing. <laughs> <is> so ridiculous. <laughs> oh, poor Lucy. Um, so yeah, just as the Kennedys are finding their footing. Avery's celebrity double catches up with them and, uh, yeah, a new, uh, challenger approaches. Um, um, yeah, I love, I love this, this angle of like, yeah, it, it feels like it's Avery's celebrity that the photo got taken over or whatever. And it just, yes, yeah, just goes yeah, south no, no, so quickly. Good. Yeah. Um, I really love how Verona cracks the fact that this is an Avery double so it's not going to be a while before it reaches us <laughs> it's so like comedically timed and also makes perfect like you know we as the audience for to lead yep. us to making the same conclusion <laughs> as she does and it's perfect it's so funny I always love moment. it when when Tex does that when you sort of realize the moment the characters do and then the thing like the way the way it leads you down the like wait so this is you with all your abilities, and it took five minutes to reach Cliff, but and then it's just st- shit starts exploding, and you're like, "Oh mm. fuck, here we go." Uh, yeah, I, I agree. I loved it. Yeah, oh, it was very, very funny. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so this we we get into a battle between uh, Avery and Flavory, um, and it's very fun. Uh, it's a uh, it's really interesting. I mean, I think this is really the thing that this is the best for is the people who want to make a respect thread for the Kenneteers so they have a reference for how uh, powerful a bloodlusted Avery is and they can use that <laughs> as kind of the feats in the respect thread. Um, but yeah, it, it's very funny to see bloodlusted Avery going all out and just pulling some absolutely crazy shit. Shit that maybe Avery is going to remember and be like, oh, I'll try that move next time we're in a fight. Yeah, I do. I do love how Lucy and Avery are both very like, oh, an Avery that won't hold back. Yeah. Fuck. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. Um, like it. Honestly, it reminds me of the Lord that Verona helped Charles make. You know, the mm-hmm. one where you do the. Uh, I think it was called the parody test or something, and like Massa had to do it, but it's where you fight someone else with your tools. And we were talking about mm-hmm. how much the Kennedys hold back compared to their enemies, and it's like a really fun. Um, I, yeah, I guess I, I don't know, and, and also just because it's like twenty one dot three, the previous chapter, half of that chapter was really dedicated to Avery making this conscious decision to kill, being w- like be willing to kill the alabaster, like innocence, and so I just think mm-hmm. it's so funny that then, like from her perspective, the very next thing that happens in her life is fucking the the part. It's always that like the parts are like, oh, you're you're ready to do murders, okay, like mm-hmm. we can get in on this, um, yeah. I like I wouldn't be able to help but read into that if I were her. <laughs> That's interesting. Like this is the Avery that you'll become or something like that. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, uh, yeah, just as soon as Avery makes the decision that she's willing to start doing murders in the right circumstances, the paths confront her with this. Like definitely felt like loaded imagery for her to reflect on. Um mm. but yeah. Uh I, I think like another important thing here too is um like so Lucy goes toe to toe with with Finder Avery for quite a while. Um and what really jumped out to me is how little Finder Avery was kind of able to surprise Lucy. Like Lucy mm. was able to react to almost everything of like, oh, she's using the black rope. Oh, she's using her air, like Jordan things. Like, yeah, Lucy was constantly able to sort of see what she was doing and, and predict it. And, and that jumped out to me because like that big thing that happened in Arc 13. Do you remember that thing where the Kennedys were trying to defend the roof against the the duo of witch hunters and they just couldn't work together mm. because they kept not being able to predict what the others were going to do? Like mm. what mm. Avery did would catch Lucy off surprise or, or whatever. And, and, yeah. and this, this feels like our first sign that that's not going to be their problem anymore because even when she's legitimately fighting against her for her life, Lucy's able to kind of predict what an Avery will do. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so just like another notch in the sort of they're they're more together than they were last time belt. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and um, yeah, I mean that it, it is very fun to see their uh, cohesiveness demonstrated through yeah. a, a villainous version of Avery. <laughs> like it's just very cool. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, this Finder Avery bit is so fun, and I kind of want to see what happens with the other Kenneteers too. Like, I want an evil trio. Um, uh, it's also, I, I guess, I just want to touch on. I don't think we have a name for it, but like conceptually, I thought this path was so fun because it's like fighting the Finder, who seems to be the primary other that shows up first. Mm. Um, it is really funny because it's kind of harder if you're better. Like, clear, like. Cliff and the others had said that this place wasn't that hard, which is almost low key telling on themselves because mm. they're not that hard to fight. So the finder wasn't that hard. like like this is harder because Avery is better, and I just think that's so funny. Mm. Um, yeah, uh, and it's also like I guess an interesting continuation of like this place seems to be connected to the Promenade <laughs> because the Garricks seem to have only discovered it since the Promenade yes. doors. Yeah. Um, and wait, I feel like it's continuing that trend we're seeing of uh, promenade-related paths being like almost meta commentary paths on like how finders and lost interact. Like, remember the the promenade sort of asked you to walk a mile in a lost's shoes. The cakewalk also kind of forced you to walk a mile in their shoes, but like get punished if you break the rules or whatever and get killed. And then this path is very much it's all about like needing to move through a crowd and follow rules and you're under constant surveillance and then somebody comes in with all these great tools and kicks your ass like Mm. um also all three of them involve kind of costume changes that take away your abilities like there's there seems to be this trend forming around the promenade of paths that are very specifically around kind of inverting finder and lost relationships in in a fun way Mm. yeah um yeah the finder is interesting i guess well, I don't know. The fact that the Finder escapes means yeah. that we uh, maybe have some more stuff to talk about with the Finder in the future. <laughs> yeah, there's just, yeah, there's some really interesting because, like, did the Finder leave the paths? But like, yeah. the Finder is not an entity that is specifically from this path. So, like, does that even no. matter? Or like, it, yeah, it's interesting. I don't know because I started. Call, I, I I don't like the architects nomenclature that you know mm. every time it comes up in the story they mention how it kind of sucks and like so yeah. I, I call things like the finder tropes on my end because like mm. i think what they are a representative of tropes that are on multiple paths or whatever but yeah that's the thing like can one of these tropes leave the paths and what does that mean what, like because if the finder is kind of the the trope of you know humans coming to the paths or whatever it kind of makes sense that in return it gets the ability to go to reality or whatever but then the fuck does it want to do there Mm. (laughs) does it have a motivation still beyond gunning for avery because that was its motivation on this time when it spawned on this path like i mean if it is if it is loaded with all of avery's skills and shit presumably it's going to go reach out to charles and stuff like if if it really still wants to fight avery that's going to be the way to go. Mm. Um, but I don't know if that's where we're heading. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's a wild, fun thing. But yeah, so yeah, the, the Finder escapes and uh, Liberty also escapes uh, from this part of the story, leaving the Kennedys to continue on their merry mission. Um, do we think that the fight? Yeah, like, I don't know. I mean, we're falling into this old trap again, but like surely some wild showdown with an escaped finder Avery can't be like a part of this story, right? It just seems like it's a, such a whole separate thing. I I also just kind of love the mystery of like not knowing what's <laughs> not up with knowing it. Like, whatever is gonna happen. You know? Yeah, this is one of those things where I almost I don't want the answer of what the finder's been doing on Earth or another path or whatever. Like mm. just just hanging in the back of our heads for the whole rest of the stories, this idea like there could be another Avery somewhere doing shit, and we just don't know. Yeah, um, like that's funny. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I guess we'll see. I, I do kind of. I love the idea of if this, if this like evil Avery is still intent on trying to fight Avery because that was its goal on this path. It feels mm. like it would have to join Team Charles, and we'll hear about that pretty soon. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, that's pretty happening. wild. If that's the case, I don't know. Yeah, it yeah. No, yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't sound right to me. But that's like that's 
what makes sense. So that's kind of why I'm going with what I think is the more fun option, which is just we'll never know. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. I also, I we already touched on it, but I really want to like highlight that moment where Liberty like checks in with Lucy and is like, hey, like, was I actually helpful here? Because um, mm. as you mentioned, she brought a very strong energy to, to all this. And I like that she's sort of aware enough to double check that she was doing good and not just like aware enough on her end, but also like speaks to the Kenneteers as well that like she trusts them enough to just be willing to ask Lucy this. I, th- I feel like you have to be either very confident or pretty good friends with someone to be like that kind of vulnerable and, and sort of be like, Hey, am I doing good here? Um, mm. I don't know. I mean, maybe it's just cause Lucy's the closest thing to Anthem around. So Liberty needed her approval, but mm. um, I don't know. Yeah. They're going to be stepsisters soon. So, you know, it, I guess it makes sense that they try to have a good friendship. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. All right, let's just leave that. Because we all know that's not going to happen, Elliot. Obviously, Avery is going to get back with her one true love, Janine. Um, no, no, no. I'm talking about Anthem and Jasmine hooking up. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, cool. Which, honestly, like, is a bit of a meme, but I do continue to hope that Lucy and Anthem will have some kind of, like, no, relationship. Agree. Like, whether I think it's, it's too perfect, isn't it? Yeah, like, like you know, Jasmine doesn't have to get in on it, but, like... Lucy and Anthem and then and thus like Lucy and Liberty sort of being in touch just it, it makes so much sense mm, mm, um, yeah no I agree oh yeah and and uh the the fucking the fashion show uh I love Liberty's plan for a fashion show it's such a rich girl plan I, like I love it for her. <laughs> it, it's so spot on too but like it's yeah. just it, it's such a like girl who grew up in mansions with access to all these clothes plan I I, I love it mm. um but yeah, so the Kenneteers uh, escape the path and head into Ottawa to witness the horrors of true bureaucracy. Um, it's effectively that one scene from Futurama where Hermes takes them to the central bureaucracy <laughs> office. Uh, but they do manage to eventually fight through to get their motion heard, which is pretty fun. Yeah, I felt like I was back at work reading this. I did not need... <laughs> wait, I come to Pale to escape my day job. I didn't need this scene. This was... <laughs> it was like half parliament, half like an overzealous tennis club. Like, because it's... It wasn't like a whole parliament. It was more like a, a, a cabinet or something. But yeah, it just had like... Have, have you ever been to like you know like it, that you have like little tennis clubs or like clubs at your college that are fucking so rigorous around having a treasurer and like uh, you know a president and all these fucking roles and it's like guys there's like 10 of you in this club you don't need this structure mm. um it, it, like that was always the vibe it gave off although in this case you know these guys kind of need this but like i don't know just considering ottawa is cat like canada's canberra i was like god the like the politics has really oozed itself into the practice scene here huh yes um so my reaction to seeing this council and how uh, almost intentionally confusingly set up it was, <laughs> was to think you know what i don't need to know the inner workings of the practitioners minds so we can just uh let other people worry about compiling their docs about what it's how it works and all that jazz but elliot i understand you went in a different direction with it <laughs> yeah well so i at first i was trying to actually understand this council and i was maintaining a doc of my own as i was reading and i was feeling really good about it and then they all switched chairs and i just i that's when i threw in the towel <laughs> i was like yeah this fuck this. that's what like, happened to me too i was like okay i'm starting to get a picture of how oh, oh okay this yeah, is yeah. Chairs, never mind. <laughs> i was like yeah i see who's who okay i'm following and yeah they they switched chairs and it was just like nah i'm out yeah. um and i've seen the docs and people are doing an admirable job but um i i, I just i kind of wanted to talk about it at a bit of a high level because i feel mm. like I haven't actually gone to double check this. I assume Canada's political system is very similar to the one here in Australia. Like this, mm. the fact that they had the shadows in the chairs felt yes. very invocative of like shadow ministers, which is a yes. concept we have here, which I don't think is an American one. <laughs> so just like, um, j- just to explain it to any American people who might not understand, um, we we have like ministers who get put in charge of something. It's like a minister of finance or education or something. And then the person on the the party that didn't win the election becomes like the shadow minister, and it's basically mm-hmm. their job to challenge the minister. Um, that's right. Yeah, it's called the Westminster system. If you want to know more, but like that, that's essentially what they've got here, where they've got these practitioners as the ministers, and then it's a bunch of others who get to be the shadow ministers who kind of question it. And that's 
the the fact that it's the practitioners as the actual ministers and a bunch of others mostly as the shadow ministers kind of mm. brings me to my point of how this is like this this council feels like kind of a step in the right direction it's better than a lot of the lordships we've seen but like also you know it's not it's not all the way there there's still some problematic elements here mm. yeah it's interesting i i do think the kind of shadow minister system theoretically has a lot of benefits of like you yeah. always have somebody with an opposing view responsible for the same we all yeah. kind of like pushing against some things that you you know can propose although as uh, we live in a world where politics gets more and more <laughs> divisive and partisan that's not necessarily how it works in practice anymore but um yeah i think it's interesting i think it does represent like the the key thing about this is it demonstrates a different system again to the ones that we've seen yeah. previously in the story right what i also think on this very show we've like pitched a, a couple of times this idea of like what if you replace the law the wards and the judges with like a more parliamentary system and have them act like the queen and just sort of you know check boxes and be a governor general who does nothing um Mm. and i i can feel that prediction slipping through my thumbs as we're seeing exactly that um here but like it, it is really fun seeing it explored like of course ottawa is the place where they're trialing something like that so the lord seems to just be the lord in name only um Mm. and really the council does all the work and i think it's yeah like you know it's it's kind of cool seeing an attempt at something a little bit more democratic um i do want to call out though there's that there's this hilarious bit where they're like like practitioner families and dynasties are still an absolutely massive part of this parliament and i i thought it was kind of funny that they're almost pretending that they're not Mm. like there's this hilarious moment where um one of the guys calls uh, the the lady who's vetoing by her name. I think it was like Belame or something. Yeah. Um, and he gets scolded by the speaker for uh, like undermining the integrity of the post by calling by her by her name yeah. and, and not her post. Yeah. You meant and to then, say Mr. Speaker. <laughs> yeah. But like, what's what's funny about that is it's like he's like. He's like, don't refer to people by their names. It's all about the post. Please ignore that. Now, what was your what was your reason for the veto? And she's like, well, this lady isn't from a good enough family. Mm. And so I was like, well, okay. So are, they, are these positions separate from the families or not? Like, it's just, I I, I thought it was hilarious the the way yeah. that like family bullshit is still firmly entrenched in this little political system we've got here in Ottawa. Which well, they are if, still practitioners. <laughs> yeah, and, and I mean, you know, if if Canada is anything to go by compared to like England and Australia. I mean, there's still very much like a a heavy classist slant to who ends up being able to run for parliament. Like Mm. you you don't get too many stories of like, you know, people from low income families actually getting to become ministers. It does tend to run through, through families and stuff. So Mm. like, this is true to form, but um, yeah, I don't know. I just thought it was funny where it was like, you know they again they're taking that step this is better than the alternatives we've seen in a lot of ways i'm like it's nice that they're trying to minimize the impact of dynasties but like it, they're kind of pretending that they're gone a lot more than they are mm. yeah yeah definitely um yeah I, yeah I just on the whole i liked the vibe of the council like they seem to be pretty good for for practitioners <laughs> yeah yeah i i agree like it was it was encouraging that you know they did because at first, you know, us and Lucy are both like, oh, my God, are we going to die in bureaucracy here while we have to sit here for weeks before we can get seen? Mm. But they do have a system for kind of like, oh, this is sheer- serious shit. Let's like fast track it, mm. which is more than I can say for my work. Uh, not all bureaucracies are, are inclusive of that sort of thing. So I was quite impressed that they were able to just put some bullshit aside and actually hear the Kennedy's out. Um like as again, it seems like a step in the right direction compared to most of the other lords and councils that we've seen. Yeah, um, I do. I do think it's funny that they're apparently struggling to fill the positions related to their crimson, aka carmine chair. Um, I I thought that was. I thought it was quite funny that seemingly the lack of decent carmine candidates is kind of an endemic issue. Uh, <laughs> there's all this talk of alabaster's going extinct but nobody's talking about the real problem which is decent Carmine's carmine going candidates extinct. yeah <laughs> yeah um no i i like um you know the council has this method for hearing rush kind of uh motions i guess yeah um 
and it seems to go well and yeah it's like they seem chill yeah i also want to give a like i guess the other thing like all of the people we met here seemed really cool mostly like even the crimson chair guy seemed like kind of an ass at times was like interested in the Kenneteers because they awoke together and that that was noteworthy to him and then um uh there's the indian guy who's doing the photocopying who's kind of joking around with verona like he mm. seemed neat mm. um and then one of my other favorites is the girl who doesn't end up getting on the chair but is the one who's yes. there and she's like look i only wanted this position because i fuck fucking hate muscle. Uh, muscle um yeah yeah so muscle's not Which, a threat I mean, anymore yeah so I, I don't right. want it <laughs> Yeah, yeah, love. That it. was one of those things where I was like, I appreciate this level of honesty in a politician, and like, frankly, if her entire platform was fuck Abraham <laughs> Musser, I can kind of, I, that probably would yeah. get my vote. Like, <laughs> yeah, now they'd need the carmine whose entire platform is fuck Charles, basically. Yeah, well, I um, mean, you know, I, I'm sure they're like, there's right. lots of people who feel that way. It's about whether they're willing yeah, to step they into this seat. Them. Yep. Um, but yeah, like, I, I don't know, Every, everyone here seemed fun, and so, like, it, uh, this is another one, uh, like, Wildbo does this all the time, like, we've met all these characters who we we probably won't see again in this story, or, uh, but, like, I could read six arcs of a story set in Ottawa fucking easy, like, mm, yeah. th- 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 this always happens in, in uh, the other verses, Wildbo introduces a great cast of characters, and it's like, either we do re- derail the story by engaging with them, or we we lose out, it's like a lose-lose. He needs to stop making such interesting groups of characters. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Oh, well. Um, yeah. Yeah. Fun council. Um, uh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Also, Gaudette, uh, as fun as she was, we do need to call out. So she is a practitioner of the divine school, primarily mm. leprous martyrdom. Yep. Yeah. I'm not talking about that. No, I'm assuming what that is referencing is like, you know, old JC used to uh, heal lepers and hang out with lepers, right? So, like, yeah. Presumably, there's some kind of like people who are leprous or like, you know, downtrodden by society have some kind of special level of martyrdom that gives them some level of divine energy that can be tapped into. I don't know. I mean, like, that but, kind of makes but sense why, to though? me. Yeah, why would you pick that? I have no idea. It means that you get leprosy or some other horrific diseases. No idea. But what was the yeah. physical description of Gaudette? Did she have any visible like disabilities? That yeah, no. It said it said she was she like her, she had tons of boils and shit under her yeah, yeah. That's right. outfit. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So fun times. <laughs> um. Yeah. It doesn't sound like the most fun type of practicing, but whatever. Uh, anyway, so yeah, we we cut to our main character, Charles, who senses a challenger and readies himself to face his toughest threat yet, Percival Awanak. I, this was a, such a fun surprise that there's just suddenly a Charles POV in the middle yeah, of the chapter. I like, I was, whenever there's something like this happens, I think it's happened like two or three times in the story where I'm always like, hey, this is illegal. Yeah. Um, and like his banner, his banner has all the cracks in them. Uh, like, yeah, just really fun. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so good, so good. I didn't expect that any character would ever top Stu Mullen in my heart, and yet here we are. <laughs> he, uh, Percy's such a pure little boy. Like, honestly, if Wabo goes through with killing him, I think that confirms that Wabo is worse than Charles. <laughs> I don't think we're going to see it. his on screen death, but I think he's <laughs> not long for this world. <laughs> <laughs> no, Wabo, you couldn't possibly actually kill this boy. He's too precious. Yeah. He needs a way out of it. Um, the, the only way out of it is to defeat Charles before the three days are <laughs> up, right? <laughs> it doesn't seem likely. Um, yeah. Um, sorry, just b- before we get back to talking about Percival at length, as he himself would do about himself. Um, I, I wanted to call out this bit where as Charles kind of is entering go mode, he reaches across realms to Marissica, who's having a nap. Mm-hmm. Um, and he, there's, again, just mention of how kind of heavy and lethargic she is at the moment. But, you know, she'll be ready to get called on. And it's a hilarious, like, no rest for the wicked moment for her. Um, but I guess it's just it's just interesting because I continue to be really stuck on where Marcy's at, what we're expecting from her. Like, you know, like, because... It seems part of me. Part of me wants to read into this and be like, "Oh, cool! So Marcy is entering a kind of uh, like lethargic mode." She talked about how annoying it was that fairies were always on, so she's mm-hmm. really relishing mm-hmm. in her new godly ability to just chillax the fuck out and not really do stuff. She's turning into more of an opossum. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, but and so part of me is like, "Well, that gives me hope that you know she's missing. She's she's missing stuff." 
like you know her plans won't be as complete and the winter court can get her or whatever but then Mm. the other part of me is like fuck that feels too easy though like i just Mm. i i i I still am completely unsure what to make of marcy because whenever we see her i'm always like i don't know whether this is a trick or not um i continue to think she's the real threat here and like she's not she's somehow getting away with murder with the lack of attention she's getting from the Kenneteers. Mm. Um, but I guess, I guess we'll see. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. She's not even a fairy anymore and she's still fucking playing these fairy games with my head where I just, I don't trust it. it seems too easy that she's got problems now because she's getting lazy. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of been a common thread that the more powerful you are in the other verse, the more difficult it is to actually spend that power, like the more institutions or systems you've tied yourself to, to get to it. And that means it actually is not as easy for you to spend it. Um, Maybe the exception being Charles, Charles is the one character we see who kind of breaks that natural order. Uh, So I don't know, maybe Marcy's bid for breaking out of being a fairy. She's happy to be more powerful, but not really be able to use it that much and just kind of live in her own little world. Oh, and yeah, I do think that there's like a an element of like that 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 poetic justice to the sense that like she becomes somebody who's kind of too slow to react and she misses yeah. things. Like she she's overcorrected. She's become kind of lazy and stagnant. Um, yeah, like there there would be. Yeah, there is a kind what, of r- r- yeah. a rhyme to it, isn't there? Yeah, exactly. Which is why I think that's the thing. Like this this works. If if this turns out to just be what Marcy is and she dies because of it. It's not going to feel like bad writing. I just refuse to like accept that that's it because that feels too easy. And I'm like, like, I just don't trust it. And that's maybe me not letting go of the old Marissica enough. But it just, Mm. I don't know. You know, we've heard she's cooking more stuff up in the abyss. And I just, as much as I'd love to see her kind of get stuck in the abyss and because it sounds like a hellhole or whatever in a weaker form, I just, I'm not willing to trust anything that's telling us about all these weaknesses Marcy might have. Mm. Yeah. Um, but yeah, taking us back to our main character for this chapter, um, it is h- as hilarious an implementation as when we heard about it in theory, but of course, Wabo skips ahead through the titles like a coward. Give us the uncut <laughs> version, Wabo. Come on. Yeah. This is the extra material we need. I, we just, mm. we, we need the extra material. That's just all 99 <laughs> titles for sure. Um, yeah, no, that would be pretty funny. <laughs> um, uh, it's also worth calling. Like, so as Charles realizes what's happening, I like, so he gets the sable to to come join him. Um, and the you know he's like, this precedent cannot stand. And the sable's like, oh, it shouldn't. No. And I just I couldn't help but read that as the sable being in on the joke because like the sable doesn't say the sable doesn't suggest they do anything about it or whatever. The sable's just like, yeah, this is pretty shit, huh? Um. Like, I don't know, especially because, like, Charles is the guy who just spent months running around doing, like, spammy, trolly gainsayings of people to, like, weaken that part of the system. So I just think it's kind of hilarious that he was a bit like, this isn't fair, it's against the rules of the system. Like, <laughs> yeah. like th- th- this was your whole fucking jam, Charles. What are you talking about? Um, yeah, like, he's just angry when people spam him with the same shit he's been doing to everyone else. I love it. Mm. Um, yeah. But I, also, I, I thought it was interesting that it's the Sable who shows up too, because like before this, Charles tries to kill Percival and the universe won't let There's him. No. Yep. Um, and then, then he like sort of just, it just as he reaches out, it doesn't specify that he reached out for the Sable, but the Sable is the one who shows up. And I, the Sable is like Mr. Rules. So mm. I couldn't help but like, maybe the Sable wanted to keep an eye on him because he could sense that Charles tried to break the rules. Mm. I don't know. Uh, maybe I'm overreading. I just want more deets on the Sable. Yeah, I mean, the Sable is very interesting in this scene because is they are helpful to Charles in some ways, but also very much like backing up the rules lawyering that the Kennetiers have, have kind of arbitrated here. Um, yeah, they're very which, much just a, a yeah. rules enforcer. Yeah. Yes, yes. But one that seems to be on the side of Charles so they can tell him which rules yeah. aren't, aren't rules, I guess, or whatever. Um, I think it's also... Uh, uh, like again the thing that continues to be my favorite aspect of charles as a character and as a villain is how much he genuinely likes and respects the kennedy is like there's this moment where uh percival says huzzah and charles just sort of responds oh i see there's some avery in your creation from that last bit huzzah mm. um like he, he laughs a number of times at this point like there he he's a bit pissed off by it but like genuinely most of the vibe i got from charles during all this is he thinks this is kind of funny and he respects the play um and like his closing line for the section is him saying, I guess the girls will have their chance. Like 
the respect he has for the skin of tears and like like the i just love it and i know i've said this a million times but it's just even even being in charles's head and seeing that he's like oh this is annoying but it's pretty funny it's just so good mm. yeah <laughs> yeah the fact that charles sees the human is pretty funny because like you know the the fact that he has 99 titles the real ploy is getting him to challenge Charles to a three day contest, not the yeah. wasting an hour of Charles' time with the ninety nine titles or whatever. That's, that's just the, very funny. That's just the asshole chafing that Verona yeah, was exactly, talking about. Like, exactly right. And, and like the ninety nine titles are so because the vibe that they had, uh, you know, and that we tried to recreate in that intro is just they've got that vibe of like, oh, the essays due tomorrow, and you haven't hit the word count. Like yeah. they're so intentionally unnecessarily convoluted and overworded and it's just such blatant filibustering and yeah well, it's so funny yeah it is pretty hilarious um, um but yeah it, so it is worth calling out too no, no doubt that some of charles's like ability to enjoy this play from the kennedy's is i don't think he sees it as a genuine threat like he, he he clearly doesn't grasp what their actual plan is or whatever but like he i don't think he feels genuinely threatened which is part of why he has that freedom to be like oh, you know those yeah, little true. scallywags i mean but you know, that's classic underestimating the Kennetius vibes, right? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, uh, we, we jump back to our, uh, I guess, our second tier protagonist, the Kennetius, <laughs> um, who briefly rendezvous with Guillaume before starting their challenge to the Alabasti. Yeah. Um, to, to touch on Guillaume before, before we get to the main event, um, I enjoy that Guillaume is unable to give us any updates on Kennet. Uh, I continue to hope that it, we will just be going like a whole arc without getting any updates on Kennet because the mystery is very fun. Um, and Guillaume seems to be helping us head in that direction. Mm. Yeah. Uh, also, just poor Guillaume. Like the fact that he had to come here with all these goblins, like poor dude. Yeah. Talk about a negative binding. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I'm very hyped for the Alabaster showdown. You can just kind of feel the Alabaster has a bunch of weird tricks up their sleeve that are going to be fucked up. And I'm really excited to find out what it, what they're going to be. Yeah, it also, it's like such a different, like, so the Alabaster comes out of these trees and there's like a dark look to her eyes. It's yeah. described as threatening. Yeah, And that, like, that, shin, that, that did send shivers down my spine because I was like, the Alabaster has always been at worst stoic, like somewhere between kind of chill and stoic, like just... Mm the you know the nice judge which makes sense given their role so like the alabaster coming out of here and looking angry i was just like this is so fucking hype like this is great mm. um and yeah like she's just such a i guess we talked about this a lot last week but she's such a fun thing to fight because in so many ways she's the opposite of charles like she she is so much an embodiment of like the status quo and all that and it's like such a huge deal to take her out it's so it's such a statement by the Kennetiers that they're doing it. And honestly, it's a mm. huge statement by Ottawa that they're willing to help them. To, to um, support it, yeah. Yeah, like this is really Ottawa taking a stance that she fucked up by supporting Charles like this. Um, so I can't wait to see, you know, I assume it's going to work eventually, but we'll, we'll, yeah, we'll get to it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's uh, that's the end of our chapter, I suppose. Yeah, too easy. Um, Boom. What that what a chapter like you know mm. of all of all those sorts of situations where we're going to end up with only one chapter to talk about in a week. This was a good one for it a, to be definitely a good one. Yeah, I am. Um, the Alabaster Showdown I just know is going to be so fucking fun. <laughs> I'm so hyped for it. Yeah, I uh, yeah, I assume that's what twenty one dot five e like is or at least starts. And but we yeah. haven't read it yet, so yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, so. Uh, so yeah, uh, we don't we didn't have full predictions to pull out this week. I just kind of want to raise a theme in predictions that I had seen, which I saw in predictions from Steve R and uh, Gist, Gistly Bird. Did that say Ghostly Bird? Was that a typo? Or was that the name? I don't know. Yeah, I was wondering that. Let though. me double check now because I'm like, it surely must be Ghostly Bird. But I did write Gistly Bird. No, it's Gistly Bird. Okay, cool. Um, but uh, this prediction theme that I saw in a few predictions of uh, that Ken is going to be the province spirit that is going to be summoned f as a way for Ken to re-enter the story, which of course I'm all for Ken re-entering the story, but mm. I don't know if it quite tracks that Ken could be a province spirit instead of a city spirit. But if there's a way for that to work, I'm very keen on it. I mean, Ken is part of the province. So like if you, yes, if you divide true. if you divide the province spirit into its various town-based Ken ponents. Yeah, Ken true. Might Maybe be one Ken of them. would be one of the Ken ponents. I um, can see that. 
I mean, do we want Ken to come back? He kind of sucked. Yeah, I mean, parts of him kind of sucked, but imagine how <laughs> cool Ken would be now that there's two new versions of Kenneth for him to embody. And well, Kenneth's no, we've, kind of we've got Liz. You know, and Kira Lynn okay, said sure, Liz yeah. is cool. Sure, so. sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that tracks. Um, anyway, should we get to our discussion question earlier? Yeah. <laughs> our discussion question from last week was, which fairy court would you sell yourself to for the memes? And there was one answer Sorry, that rung I, of all others. I, I do need to switch that. It was actually for the lols. The post, oh, got, the post got removed from the from the Parahuman subreddit for containing the word memes, so I had to change it to lols. <laughs> sure, sure, My bad. Sure. No worries. Um, but yeah, uh, the, the the answer that seemed to be very, very popular was uh, somewhere above. Everybody yeah. wanting to live their best Narnia lives, basically. Yeah, I, I think Fairlax kind of summed up the general vibe everyone had pitching that uh, pretty well, which is um, they said somewhere above because it has the best odds of me getting rescued by a dashing hero who will fall in love with me and bring me into a young adult fantasy romance novel before my life collapses and really that's how i've always wanted to go out yeah and yeah you know what like i get that like if you if you're gonna have to die to fairy bullshit summer above kind of seems like the best flavor um yeah uh, hobo demon had a similar but slightly different take on it as well of like if i'm gonna be a human in a fairy court i could easily be like the shitty comedic sidekick to a high summer fae and <laughs> maybe be because that's naturally being a shitty sidekick is naturally what a human would be in the fake courts but maybe it would sit better in high summer where that can kind of fly rather than in a different court where you're just being shit and people will kill you for it yeah yeah teve who also answered um high summer yeah it's mentioned the same thing they're like they want to be the sancho to someone's quixote yes um which yeah i was like that you know if you can if you if you reckon you can somehow swing that that does seem like a best case scenario yeah um ripper 1337 also mentioned high summer but also said being the straight man in a high spring drama would be pretty entertaining if it worked out so <laughs> yeah that yeah we did get a um like, like spring was probably the other one that came up landis 963 mentioned dark spring mm. um just because you know uh, it's it's going to be very beautiful and you know without all the stuffiness of the kind of regency crown sort of stuff that high spring has but yeah um so you know i guess it, it, you, you'd burn out hard and fast hopefully in in dark spring is their sort of thinking <laughs> yes. uh, and then captain rhino gave the uh technically in line with the letter of the question but not the spirit <laughs> answer which was the eighth court of course um hanging out with cool goblins maybe rescued by jt pool and liberty ted and hanging out with kennet witches which yes of course would be fun <laughs> I mean, I, uh, like, I, if if we take this this answer to its extreme, like, let's say the eighth court becomes a thing and it mm. grows, and there's actually like an eighth court realm or whatever, mm. it's going to be the nice goblins. If Toad Slow has his say, sure, but like, yeah, 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 you know, it's You're still right. going to be it's not going like, to be the nice. It's not yeah. going to be just nice goblins. I sell like if the, if these goblins own you, like it, you know. Yeah, if you sold like, yourself to them. Yeah, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of room to still get some pretty gross stuff happen to you. I think. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Uh, so so you know I I like I, this answer I think in the context of pale seems like the right answer, but I feel like if you go larger picture, there's 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 problems with it that bring it about to the level of all the other terrible answers. Yeah. Yeah. Because there is no right answer. The right like the right answer is don't sell yourself to the fairy courts. What are you doing? Yeah um but yeah thank you everyone for uh for responding to our discussion question of course we have a new discussion question this week elliot do you want to introduce it to the folks yeah uh, so this one was suggested by i'm easily impressed um and we basically want to hear from people what are some of percival's other titles mm. um you can give us the abbreviated versions if you want because realistically we're probably going to have to abbreviate them anyway when we bring them but um you know the kennedy is filled 99 titles in there and i think we heard less than 10 so what what do you reckon what else do you reckon they jammed in there yeah um and give your give it a number give it a number yeah. and then we'll <laughs> compile a full list for the titles yeah and uh, just to just to preempt it um six, 69 is going to be a funny one so uh, you know somebody's going to pick yeah. that I, I, I can already tell yep can't wait can't wait to see what it is um, but yeah, you can leave your answers to that discussion uh, question in our discussion thread, which is linked in the show notes down below. 
Of course, if you would like, you can also check out our Twitter where we post memes every single day at Power Reflect Cast. Um, uh, yes. And while Does you're... It- uh, Elliot, Sorry? please don't interrupt me while I'm doing the outro. Oh, God, no. Uh, so I'll, I'll start again. You can leave your answers to that discussion thread in our dis- uh, to that discussion question in our discussion thread, which is linked in the show notes down below. If you want, you can check out our daily memes every single day at Power Reflect Cast. And hey, if you want to check out more information about the other shows on the Doof Media Network, why not go to doofmedia.com, the website where you can check out information on all the other shows. Okay, now you go, Elliot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, we also have a Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Doof Media. That funds things like this show. Uh, also, like the costume contest that we are running now, like the prize money of 100 US dollars that goes to the winner of that comes from our patrons. So... Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, that's the place if you want to support cool costumes and cool art uh, to go. Yeah, definitely. And while you're on Patreon, why not check out Wildbo's Patreon um, at patreon.com forward slash Wildbo. If you keep giving him money, he will keep coming up with titles. For- <laughs> that's a, a, a asterisk on that one because I just made it up. But um, you should just give him money anyway because it's great that he comes up with wild things like Percival to exist at all. <laughs> cool. And with that note, we'll see you all next week. Bye.